that in the beginning but I really am. I mean this is such a unique uh, organization. Uh, you know when, it, when I, I'm a member of USA and ever since I joined the military in 78, 79, uh, when you picked up the phone and you talked to the guy or the woman on the other end, I never would have guessed they're living in this place. This is amazing, 14,000 strong. Um, you get hungry, you can go to whatever. <laughs> you got Starbucks, so God love you. This is it's just truly, truly a great time to be here, and I'm so glad the media is going ahead and taking care of uh, September 11th and uh, the memories of that. You know, every year, all you really see is on September 11th, you see them at Ground Zero tolling the bell. This year, you know, National Geographic ran a whole almost two weeks of everything about 911, and they didn't, they didn't focus on just the towers coming down, they focused on the families and they focused on the fact that America has changed, which was very impressive, so you know, that's neat. Unfortunately, it's sad that it's taken 10 years to get that kind of coverage, but it has the ability now to let everybody know exactly what September 11th means. You know, I can tell you from my point of view, bringing the president into locations, see the crowd out there and as soon as we would roll and turn the crowd had just come alive in 2001 2002 everybody was supporting the president it's just it was amazing fortunately as the end of 2008 came along a lot less people were there a lot less uh, concerns uh, about meeting the president one more thing i want to tell you every time we went somewhere after the war started servicemen and women were injured they were at the foot of the stairs and you could see folks that lost legs and lost arms I, my middle daughter my little girl is handicapped been in a wheelchair all her life so we went to Walter Reed all the time so we had Walter Reed be there once a week guys just started coming in after the war started and the coolest part was their lives had changed their families were with them these are young kids 19 20 year old kids that have lost limbs they're right there with my daughter and you're talking to them and they're so proud to be in the army so proud to be a marine and they're right there they're being taken care of they continued on they they're they, it wasn't like they were getting out of the service all they were thinking about is hey eventually i'm going to get my prosthetic i'm getting back to my unit everything's going to be fine i don't have to worry about anything coolest change of ideas in the military president bush we pull in the location Senators, congressmen, and be standing in line, and then toward the end of the line would be a military man, a young Marine. In one case, when I went into uh, the Midwest, had lost both legs, limited use of his right arm. As we come in, the young Marine, he's in his chair, and he comes to attention, and he brings his hand up, and he salutes, and he stays at attention the whole time Air Force One comes in, as every military man would do. The president comes bounding down the stairs. You can hear on the staff radios, the staff is telling, hey, get a hold of the president, let him know that the young man has limited use of his hand. Their fear being is that with all the film going on, that the president would go ahead and you know shake the man's hand wrong, et cetera. So you see the young staffer come next to the president, and you can hear that he's telling the president, you know, the man has limited use of his right hand. He doesn't get a chance to get that out. President Bush just moves him away. And then you hear the young staffer say over the radio, the president says he knows how to greet a man, leave him alone. States to a young Marine that's sitting there, salute him. The president drops to his knees and he hugs the Marine. And then he turns and he looks at the family that's sitting over behind where the press is at and he motions for them to come over and the whole family comes together. At that point he points to the cockpit. Now it's my job to take care of the servicemen. Going to do it anyways, but all it takes is one point by the president to He's taking care of that family. So I bring him on board. The president comes back. He goes ahead and meets with the family. And he's there. The other thing you don't ever see is the president. He always met with the families of the fallen. It was never publicized. I could see it all the time. The families would come in. He would go ahead and meet with the families. You know, I, I have no idea what that's, that is like. I don't envy that of anybody. But he did it all the time. He would come back and he would be sad. And so he would sit in the office. 
So uh, I can tell you that he was very, he had a great idea of what he was doing. He knew he was sending people to war. He knew what the sacrifice was. And that's why all of us in the military, myself included, if he called today and he needed anything, I'd drop everything. I'd be right there to support him as he supported me. Anybody got any questions of me? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, sir. First of all, thank you for your service. Thank you. I was curious if you could share the story of the boots that you got in the present. <laughs> That's the craziest thing ever, and uh, uh, you said boots, right? Boots. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said that, I realized it was wrong. You know you're talking about a room full of water. Every time we went to Houston, there was a man named Rocky that was in Houston. He made boots for all the presidents as well as, you know, kings and queens and that kind of stuff. Um, the president was getting his boots from him, and we, every time Rocky would show up, he'd always show up with a, uh, let's see what you guys call it, a, uh, what's, what's your thing for the beef, you know, the sirloin, the big roast, or whatever, the, uh, brisket. 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 Yeah, he'd always show up with it. Sorry about that. I'm not a Texan. <laughs> so he'd show up with the big brisket, and he'd go ahead, and he'd come on board, and he'd bring people for a tour of Air Force One, and he always did it. Rocky did the same thing. Loved the guy to death. He would do everything. But well, one day he stops and he throws down a, a piece of paper and he goes, Colonel, come here. And it's stand on the paper. So I stand on the paper and he literally draws my feet. And uh, next thing you know, he says, yeah, I'm going to make you a, a pair of boots. I said, well, you know, I'm not a boot guy. You know, I wear you know, flip-flops all the time. So <laughs> not a big deal. So he said, no, I'm going to send you some boots. Well, in the mail comes a pair of boots, great leather, with a presidential seal on it, Air Force One, and on the side of it says, you know, Mark Tillman. So I always kept them in the closet and that kind of stuff. Never used them much, but I've got them. I've got my I love, I love me wall, and so they're sitting there. So the, the media, when they saw those, they were so excited. Oh, you got boots! You know, that's that's the story. It was a great photo op. Yeah, it was actually. It was pretty cool. Can you get a question? Yes, sir. First from the news. Uh, yeah, see, Emily, Emily worked for Carl Rove, so all part of the White House. So I hope I can say that. But, anyways, uh, yes. she can confirm there's a lot of, you know, that's why we all uh, basically, anytime I went anywhere, I would always, if I'm sitting in a bar while there's a sports program going on, the crew of Air Force One, we'd always have CNN on. <laughs> and one of us would always be watching CNN. You know, and the reason being is because of people like yourself, bloggers, cell phones, etc. You get the story a lot quicker than any kind of agency, first responder would ever get it. And the first responders do the same thing. I don't know how many times uh, we were either accused of things or whatever, it's because somebody went ahead and called the local newspaper, called the media and said, hey, I see a plane over flying us right now, you know, and it looks like Air Force One. You know, that that's where it all comes from. So, I, you know, that's how, and on that day, the media was the only thing that we had. New York, all the cell phones, everything was saturated. So a lot of the people we were trying to get hold of that day, we couldn't get a hold of. Them. You got to remember, all of our plans were based on the Cold War. Remember, they're going to shoot rockets at us. We're all going to hunker down. We're all going to start drinking water and canned food or whatever. And then all the communications were going to be destroyed. Well, we didn't get hit by nuclear weapons, but our communications were destroyed mainly because. Right now, if you had to call your family, how would you do it? You'd hit your cell phone. You wouldn't go to a landline, which is in seven feet away from you. You'd use your cell phone. You're underground right now. You're still going to try to use your cell phone. That's what happened that day. So to try to get a hold of everybody around the country, we were calling people. We couldn't get a hold of them because their cell phone traffic was completely saturated. We couldn't get a hold of them in their office because they're Americans. They walked outside. Set that prime example. Pentagon bombed. All the plans, what do you think SECDEF is supposed to do? Get into a little area and start worrying about the military <coughs> side of it. He did. He did what an American does. He went out. He started helping. He was the first responder himself. But he was on his cell phone. We had no way to get a hold of him, basically. The successors program, kind of an interesting factor here. We had to get a hold of a lot of people. We couldn't get a hold of them because they were relying on cell phones. They left their office through the cell phone in their back pocket. They're doing things. They're going to see what's going on. We couldn't get a hold of them. So, you know, that's why we had to use the media. The yeah. media literally 
was coming up with information, but a lot of the information was false. Right. And it's seen here the moments what you thought was happening, and we right. had more access to media, so we probably knew things that you didn't know until right. like seconds or minutes later, but just the emotions that you all must have been going through as you were getting information was changing so quickly. It's, that was a really new perspective to that yeah, day. Yeah, communication is essential. And, and on that day, literally the radio operators are telling me they're watching TV and it's literally flickering because it was a tuner on the plane where you would tune those antennas and you'd tune it into a local news station. We were lucky that all the local news went national. So as we're flying across the country, you know, we're hitting KOTT or whatever in, you know, Jackson, Mississippi, but it gone national. So we're hitting their antennas. We're getting information, but there were periods of time where all of a sudden it would, it would flop out. And then we'd try CBS. So all we had was ABC, CBS, and NBC. And as a result of that, the radio operators are watching it and they're passing information hey, looks like the South Tower collapsed. And then we get the word from our command and control structure South Tower just collapsed. We've got all kinds of access for. Uh, and not only the media, but uh, we've got people now. The White House was revamped so that there's, you know, maybe there's a guy now watching ABC or something. I don't know, but he's giving us information constantly. I have another question. I'm sorry. I'm just. This is probably like not even what you're thinking about, but I mean, were you and like the staff on the plane like because you thought you were engaged in war? I mean, how did your families factor into that? Were you guys able to like tell your families like when you were no, I took, or anything? I took a big hit for that. The uh, the crew. Of <laughs> <laughs> the crew of 30 that I had, uh, as soon as we found out what was going on, I told the whole crew to go ahead and shut all their cell phones off and that I would uh, you know, bring them up my charges if I saw anybody on the phone. The reason being is because yeah. I didn't want to take a chance that they were giving away any information. You know, 30 people, 10 of them flight attendants, everybody was trying to call home and I stopped it immediately. You know, it, it just it wasn't necessary. They didn't need to do it. They were in the military. We all had to go ahead and uh, decoy and get out of there. So that's what everybody did. You know, a lot of the a lot of the folks hit me at the end saying, "Hey, sir, you didn't even trust us. You know that we wouldn't call call our families." You know, and I was like, yeah, you're right. I apologize. But then, less than 18 months later, I did a surprise visit to Baghdad, and I didn't tell any of them about that either until execution day. And they all were upset that, "Hey, you couldn't trust us with that secret." So, yeah, I mean, wasn't going to take a chance. I mean, that's what you do. But, uh, Sir. How long was it till you were able to reach out to your family, and what was that conversation like? Um, I didn't. I didn't. I'm divorced now, but. Back to questions. Here's the real story. I always have to keep going. I didn't talk to my family until uh, I landed and let them know that I was safe. Um, I, I figured they could be watching TV. Same with the rest of the crew. Everybody when we landed was set, but in, in an actuality, I made a phone call to my deputy, Mark Manny, and told him to go ahead and call all the families, tell them that they're safe, you know, that we can't get a hold of them, but at least let all the families know that the crew is safe. And uh, that's what he did. He called all the wives and husbands and said, hey, you're, you know, the crew's fine, everything's going, you know, they don't know when they're going to be back, but, uh, yeah, everything's good to go at this point. And that wasn't why I got divorced. <laughs> But I didn't tell her about bag yet. That was probably the big. <laughs> we, we've got time for one more question. If there is any. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh yes, sir. <laughs> When's the last time you saw President Bush? I see. It, this is the coolest thing ever. The uh, when I uh, retired from the Air Force, I was hired by Discount Tire, and I went to training in Dallas. Um, I got the opportunity to sit down with President Bush for an hour over in his office in Dallas, and. Uh, coolest thing ever. I mean, just one-on-one -on -one with the president. He was talking about, you know, all the great things that were accomplished. And he was telling me about how important his book. And it was just neat. It was just, it was cool to see him so relaxed. He was so excited about writing his book. You know, and, yeah, uh, I shouldn't say this, but it's, it was neat. It's just President Bush. As he's sitting there talking with me, he's drinking coffee, and the coffee gets pulled on his shirt. So he's got this big coffee stain. He was making fun of me because yeah, I don't know how to dress, so I came in with, with crazy clothes and a plaid shirt. So he's like, you know, hey, who's dressing you? you know, <laughs> but then I looked at him and I was going, yeah. he looks at and he goes, it doesn't matter. <laughs> 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 and so, and then we talk, anyways, 
uh, in November, I went to the Reagan Library because the president was speaking about his book. So uh, I went to the Reagan Library. Um, as I walk in, they've got a, a chair all set for me. So I was like, wow, that, that's pretty nice of them to do that. But it was like three rows right behind where the president's going to be. So as I sit down in the chair, you know, I was like, you know, I really don't need to be up this close and all that. Nobody around knows what I've been doing. So all of a sudden, the curator of the museum starts talking about 27,000, the aircraft above you in the, in the Reagan Library. And we flew that into San Bernardino for Nancy Reagan. And he started talking about it. Colonel Tillman was here, and he had flown the plane in and all that. You know, and, and he, he points to me and, you know, and Colonel Tillman, thanks for coming. Well, President Bush was in the front row next to that, and Nancy Reagan, he stands up and turns and goes, Tillman! <laughs> <laughs> said that, and then uh, shortly after that, a lady comes up next to me, and she's got an eight and a half sheet of uh, paper, and on it says, "Nancy Reagan and President Bush would like to know if you'll join them for dinner." You know, I was like, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, I got escorted upstairs, and I had a chance to sit down. Probably about forty folks, little tables on the top of the Reagan Library, and uh, just cool. sit down and uh, you know, say hello to the president again yeah. and all that, listen to his stories. But the coolest part was. <coughs> he had a whole setup for his book, but he started out with talking about all the great things that I'd accomplished on September 11th in Baghdad and all that kind of stuff. And he was just telling everybody about it. And then it gets down to the end, it was like, you know, I got a book to sell. And then he started talking about that. So, <laughs> love the man to death. Uh, that was the last time I saw him. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you.